Hello, I'm Dan. I'm Simon. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article each week and we talk about what we find. Simon, what are we talking about this week? This week, Dan, we're talking about cork encoding. Cork encoding. Cork, as in the kind of thing that you put in a, a wine bottle. Um, it's named not after... The, not like the, the town in Ireland. Well, that, 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 that's what well, it's the county, named after. Right? It's a county. Uh, it's definitely a city. Um, mm. I No, I don't think it's a county because they have... Isn't it provinces in Ireland? This is this is where Brian will come over and, and beat Got to be up. different. Got to be different. Um, yeah. But I'm pretty sure that Cork is where the name comes from for the thing that you put in, you know, in wine as well because it's a, mm. it's a wood, right? It's a, you know, it's, yes. it's, it's a particular kind of wood that was then used. Um, for that purpose Mm. so so cork encoding is also from uh the city uh and it relates to latex which is the language computer language that i coded my um phd thesis in so actually very relevant the one that i believe i referred to in an older podcast as la tech is that right la tech or latex yes um yeah (laughs) um which to be fair it's it's only um used in sort of academia really like or if you're like a a typesetter not a typesetter i mean like a publisher you know like if you're actually properly formatting books um it's relatively Mm. niche so i think we can forgive you for that one Uh, but i had to admit I, i had not heard of cork encoding before so um it's character encoding used for encoding glyphs in fonts so things that aren't um Oh, no, it does include letters. Oh, okay. So it, it's basically associating a particular um, feature in a language, like a letter or a punctuation mark or uh, a punctuation mm. or, or a letter with an accent or anything like that uh, with a number. I see. So um, you, you refer to that number in, in the computer code, and then that's the glyph that gets produced. Um, so it mm. includes 256 characters. So if you give me a number between 0 and 255, I can tell you what uh, the glyph, associated glyph with that number is. Uh, can you tell me 212? 212 is O with a hat, uh, which is... Oh, what's that called where you have a hat on a letter? Um, oh, God. I have that. absolutely no idea. Circumflex. Of course it's a circumflex. There we go. That's from... That's from the Tom Milsom song, B-R-B-O-M-G, lol, R-F-L-M-A-O, um, circumflex underscore circumflex, I love you so, which is the internet love song before he turned out to be a massive sexual predator. Oh dear. That, that oh, was... lovely. And the podcast, how many minutes Good morning, are we in? morning, everyone. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. We've, already, we've already turned all dark. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's O with a cir- capital O with a circumflex. Um, it, right. you, this is a thrilling spectator sport if you want to give me another one. <laughs> Between 0 and 255. Um, 56. Ooh, 56 is the number 8, confusingly. 56 equals 8. Wow. Is 56 a multiple of 8? No, it, it just works sequentially. So you've got, like, tiny, like, yeah. iotas at the top and, and like, um, a circumflex on its own and, like, uh, a, 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 what's it called? An apostrophe, full stop, comma, and things like that. And then you work your way to... Mm. Um, uh, things like hashtag dollar sign open parentheses close parentheses stuff like that then you have the numbers then you have letters then you have um like another set of uh brackets and then you have all the special characters so it's just sequential okay um, though interesting mm. there's also things like oh it's a typographic ligature that's interesting mm. things like ff and fi fortissimo and what no it, it's um it's called, they're called. I'd not heard of these. They're called typographic ligatures, which is where two or more graphemes or letters are joined as a single glyph, or a Gosh. gif, if you're actually pronouncing it correctly. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I'd not. I've never even heard of those. Um, but at the bottom, there's there's some weird ones. So you've got like O with an umlaut and stuff like that, and then you've got like O. That's like a, a Nordic letter. Um, you know, O with a um, line going through it. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't seem to have a name. It's just, as Wikipedia says, is it it's... pronounced. Is that like an? Isn't it meant to be pronounced as like an "u" uh sound? Yeah, I think so. I think it's like an "o e" kind of sound. Because it's like, um, what's that fish? It's like surströming or something, isn't it? Like that. It's like rotten fish in a tin that's 
Oh, vile and will make yeah, you sick. It, if you... It's meant to be like the worst smelling thing in the world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's so there's that. There's um. Oh, that's like um. <clears throat> it, it, imagine like a vertical line, and then there it, uh, there's like a half O on the right hand side of it. It's I think you see it in like Icelandic mm. names. Oh, it's called a thorn. Right. Which I believe I'm right in saying is where we get things like Yeldy Shop in English because. Um, right. It was a thorn rather than a, a Y originally. Uh, people people interpreted mm. it as a Y rather than a TH. I think I'm right in saying mm. that. It's almost like I have Wikipedia in front of me and I could check, but I don't want to. Uh, it's like the old English um, uh, S looking yeah. like an F, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then lastly, the very last letter is um, an... Oh, I didn't know that's what it was called. An Eset, uh, which is the double S in German. Like Scharfer's S is what they also call it. So it looks like oh, a, yeah, a beta yeah. kind of thing. Which is, it's interesting though. Like there's 256 things in, uh, that you have to include whenever you come up with uh, a font. You know, it's not just as simple mm. as doing capital letters and lowercase letters. Um, there's mm. like all these little special cases that must get used so infrequently. Like I think there's, is that an interrobang? There's, there's an inverted question, of course, for Spanish. Um like mm. there's all these random what well, to us as english users very very random um uh you know letters and things which obviously to other people must yeah. be absolutely essential and this is only in latin alphabet like it doesn't this doesn't even mm. include th- writing systems like cyrillic or arabic or or whatnot mm. actually interestingly i don't know if you've um i started listening to uh the highlights of the today program so i know that this week Mm. Um, Kazakhstan is changing its alphabet like the whole country is changing its alphabet from Cyrillic to Latin which mm. sounds like it's going to be the most confusing thing in the world like imagine if you were told tomorrow that oh now from, every, from as Nigel Farage was right uh, and the EDL were right everything in the UK is now going to be in Arabic you've got to just learn the Arabic alphabet now like how much chaos would that cause? That, yeah my goodness it's like take saying English we're actually going to revert back to hieroglyphics <laughs> Well, no, that's what we're doing with emojis, to be fair. Emojis are a form of hieroglyphics. Just a slightly more cringeworthy form. <laughs> yeah, to be fair. Oh, do you reckon that's what the ancient Egyptians thought? Because obviously there was like, um, there were different levels of hieroglyphics. There would be like the the everyday vernacular kind of thing. And then there'd be the stuff they've put on mm. the walls. And then do you reckon they looked at that as in like, oh, it's a bit cringe, isn't it? Like, they're just it's mm. it's... It's it's just sort of too obvious when you look at it. It's it's like if we had a temple yeah. uh, at commission today or a mausoleum, and there were just you would describe somebody's life with a sequence of emojis. Mm. Like what what would your epitaph read in emojis if you had to like summarize your life into a few emojis? Um, oh gosh, it would probably be um, the the lady dancing it with the red dress. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, then the kind of polite smiling face i'm gonna say so it's the one that's got like the tiny little smile um i've always interpreted like that the, just the plain one i've always interpreted that as like the nervous smile it's like i'm not quite sure what to feel but i'm smiling because i'm english and just like gonna hope that everything's all right okay i've always interpreted that one as the really plain looking smile which i never use because i think it looks ridiculous the diff the, the like the default one when you do a a, a colon and a bracket the one that comes up after that. Oh, oh, right, right, right. I, I loathe. Oh no, because I use that one a lot. I use that. I use that one as like. A... It just looks so unfeeling, and like this is just this is a normal human response that I should be. Whereas in the other ones, all have a de- like an added degree of kind of emotion and look a little bit more genuine. I think. But sometimes it's like I don't want to give off the impression that I'm grinning like a maniac. Like if somebody says something and it's like, then why use ple- an emoji? Well, it's like if some if it's like a pleasantry, it's like it was nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, it was nice to meet you. And then like colon close parentheses. So it's just like it's nice to meet you, slight smile, rather than like it was nice to meet you, grinning like a fucking loon, or or grinning. Well, this is the thing: the grinning, the the really massive grinning one. I never use either. There's the one that's got the massive beaming smile, and then there's another one that's just it's slightly less than like the default. It's like a t- he's got like a tiny little smile on his face, and his eyebrows are kind of like. They're, they're kind of like slightly raised. It kind of looks kind of like... There's the one with the um, rosy cheeks. I use that one a lot. You know, it's like smiling. I think that's the one I'm talking about. Hang on, I'm going to go on Emojipedia or something. Emoji keyboard. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let's let's find out what the name is. Right. So we the one that we're agreeing on is... Uh, oh, this is the Android version. So this is the version I'm familiar with. So this is also the, the interesting thing that like there are slight differences between android and apple i say interesting in the loosest possible way um so the default 
I think if you um, have colon close parentheses is slightly smiling face. I think that's what that, that's actually called. Right. Okay. Um, was I thinking of a different one that was like even? Sl- oh no! I think I was thinking of the one that was like um, it, 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 half of the mouth is like kind of is frowning. If you know what I mean, like it's confused. It's like oh, mm. that doesn't sound good. Um, and I think the one that I use a lot with with Pixel Girl is um, white smile. Oh my god! It's actually called white smiling face. Gosh. What? What's white about it? That's not all white. That's not all white. Yeah, exactly. But, um, nice. Same label. Um, oh wow! Did you know that there are? Oh, maybe this is just specific to this website, but there are emojis for elves, like elf male, elf female, and mer person and vampires. This can't be. I've never seen these on my my phone. But sounds sounds very odd. Why is it called white smiling face? That can't be right. Mm. White mm. smiling face emoji. This this sounds that that's what it's actually called. Mm. Why would you not call it blushing smiling face? So is that the one that you su- is that the one you mean where you like you use that more often? Um, I can't see it. Type so type white smiling face emoji into Google. Hang on, hang on a second. White smiling face. Yeah, partly to convince myself that I haven't just been pranked by Google. White smiling face emoji. Yes, that is the one I use. That is the only smiling face I ever use. Oh, now that to me is like sometimes there are there are occasions when like the whole like blushing face like just does doesn't seem appropriate to me. Like I wouldn't use that um, normally if I was talking to a subscriber, for example. I'd use the default slightly smiling face. I feel like that one has like mm. slight connotations of like uh, intimacy. We may the the reason why we why we might prefer it one over the other is because apparently the uh, the Apple version has the eyebrows whereas the android version does not but that's interesting because i'm looking at the i think i'm like i'm looking at the emoji keyboard online website which is emoji keyboard.org mm. and these look very familiar to me hang on I, what, what am i doing i can get my phone out like because those ones have eyebrows and they look familiar to me as in like they look like the ones i'd use on whatsapp so hang on this is this mm. is r- truly riveting listening uh for the readers at home oh no wow yeah that one and there's a few others on my on my phone don't have eyebrows mm. but i don't think that makes it well, creepy like like how grima Wormtongue doesn't have eyebrows and he's the only person in lord of the rings that mm. doesn't have eyebrows but why is i still don't understand why is that called white smiling face i like i i don't know that's really odd apparently it predates emoji and it works in all manner of older browsers and operating systems but i it's don't what yeah so, I don't understand. I don't, well, okay. So the Unicode name is White Smiling Face. It's not white. <laughs> Why? Why would you call it that? But if it predates, if it predates emoji, it wouldn't have had color. Yeah, but then surely none of them it would. would have just. It would have just been. It would have just been a. Yeah, no, but exactly. But if it, if, if this is the one that does. So for instance, okay. So I'm on emojipedia. Uh, emojipedia.org, right? Right. If you scroll down and you can see, you can view what it looks like on other devices if you look what it htc clearly uses the old one and it's just it's a it's a face with no color so okay then the question becomes why did that not become the standard smiley face like who knows rather than because that to me looking at the htc one which for, for readers at home is just a circle with two dots for eyes or two ovals for eyes and a smiley face that to me looks like yeah. the default smile so why then did it sort of become on like looking at them all on google on apple on facebook um, on Twitter, it, all of m- almost all of these have got like a smiley face with rosy cheeks, rather than just the default. Oh, oh this is irking me. This is really mm. irking me. It's very odd, isn't it? Wow. So who would who would have thought that uh, cork encoding would have led us down t- such a passionate road? Um, yeah. So there isn't very much left in this article, by the way. Um, like it's basically saying that it's good for Western languages. It was when was this from? It was from uh, nineteen ninety from a tech users uh, tech users group so it's as old as i am uh, which is cute Uh, and it is ancient and it is one of wow several uh encodings uh and it's i could tell you that it's uh slightly suboptimal for um croatian turkish romanian galician portuguese and spanish that's interesting it's lacking spanish Wow. Well, it's no. It says it's slightly suboptimal for Spanish because it lacks characters tiny a as like a superscript and tiny o as a superscript. Yeah. Which are not superscript versions of lower the lowercase ones because they're 
they're fatter. I, I don't know. And then apparently it doesn't have any support for Welsh, Latvian, Lithuanian, or Esperanto, which is weird because I thought Esperanto mm. is designed to be um, uh, like as easy to use as possible. So that mm. seems weird. Actually, I, I do now finally at least know somebody that, that knows Esperanto, which is Alex um, Rapstract, um, who as a um, PhD student uh, uh, who lives in Cainsham but does a lot of science communication stuff as well. Um, yeah, and he's he's dead into languages. So uh, he's a, he, we've had, we've read his emails out before, Alex Lathbridge. Yes, but um, yeah, because I've always been interested in Esperanto. I've always liked the idea of abstract kind of communication. Mm. Uh, much like this podcast, this, that, that's like the subtitle yes. of this this podcast, the Wikicast, abstract communication. Yeah. So I have a correction. I I've, I have a note here. Hang on, listen to this. Right. I have a little sticky note that I've been keeping on my desk all week with some things that we should talk about because um, I, I deliberately went with this article. Um, because you know th- there isn't too much to talk about because there there are some things that we should talk about number one a correction right from two weeks ago i <laughs> i we would do you remember somebody asked me about canadian slang uh yes and i uh incorrectly said uh the same thing was a chichim skeecher a very yes. rather confidently because i thought i've been taught this in new york I'd like to apologise, as I did last week, to the nation of Canada, because it turns out I have uh, reconvened with my Canadian friends on WhatsApp, and they have confirmed to me that the correct phrase is not "chichim skeecher," but "skookum chucher." Ah, uh, well, of course. Which sounds just as you know sensible, and I believe that that uh, means something that is very good at going fast. Like it's, I think, right. I think if it's something is a chucher, if it like goes. Which I presume comes from like yeah. choo choo train or something like that, um, like but then and something is skookum if it's like that's really well made that's really good, like oh that's really skookum set of set of shoes you got there, eh? That's like something out of Roald Dahl. I like it. I got to say skookum chucher. It's like oh the the Canadian version of Gert Lush. Yeah. So that that is my correction, um, and then something a tragedy occurred this week which oh, no. is of unprecedented proportions frankly in the history of humankind which is were you aware right. of jk rowling's uh, announcement on twitter oh, yes yes yeah. do you want to describe to the readers what this was well uh there was um there's a a pub in exeter that uh, simon and i used to frequent uh semi-regularly semi-regularly it's superb we've mentioned it in the yeah, we've uh, we've we've referred to it in the podcast before um it's called the the old firehouse uh, and it was rumoured, and it's the kind of the, the story that is told um, to all kind of freshers coming into the uni or anyone who goes to Exeter University uh, or Exeter in general, um, that it was the the inspiration for the Leaky Cauldron. Which I never believed. Um, in... I've, I've never believed that it was the Leaky Cauldron. No, it was clearly the Three Broomsticks. I've... Like, the Leaky Cauldron was yeah, meant to be yeah, dark it's... and dank, and the Three Broomsticks is everything that's nice and warm in the world, and that is Firehouse. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Uh, uh, J.K. Rowling announced on Twitter the other day that she had never actually been to. Did you see what her house. taste in pubs was? Which pub she did go to? Uh, no, I didn't. The, it wasn't King Billy. Was it, it wasn't King Billy. It was nearly as bad. There were two which don't exist anymore, and then the other one which does exist. Oh, actually, Mill on the X. Black Horse. The, Mill on the X was one. Oh, Mill on the X. And, Mill on the X is lovely. And actually. yet, the Black Horse. Oh my god! See, the Black Horse is. I mean, maybe in her time it was different. The only reason people don't go there now is because it's it's just overpriced. Yeah, um, true. If any if any Black Horse employees or owners are are, are listening, I do apologise, but it's honestly ridiculous. There's a reason why no students go to your pub. It's stupidly expensive. I mean, the, um, especially considering the other prices available. Like, I imagine that's that sounds like, from memory, it was basically London prices. And I feel like if everybody yeah. agreed in an OPEC type style, so everyone was going to charge those prices, then you know they wouldn't. Mm. Everyone would just pay. But like, it does seem a bit ridiculous compared to the market. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly not. A, it's not like a, it's not an unpleasant place, though. It's not like um, I don't think. Have we mentioned the the King Billy before? No. Do you do you want to describe some of the legends around the King yeah. Billy? So, uh, as 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 one approaches the high street um, from a, from from the direction of the of the university, if you're walking down, this is tremendously uh, uh, valuable to readers, especially <laughs> those who've never been to Exeter. Um, if you walk down Pennsylvania Road, um, you'll you'll hit the high street, and just on the corner, before ironically, you hit John Lewis, which is a kind of a, a hub for the middle classes. <laughs> um, immediately uh, preceding it, you uh, you're greeted by. I mean, in its defence, it's quite an interesting building. 
Interesting um, in what in terms way? Of its, like... <laughs> I mean, it's it's architecturally unique. It looks like somebody made a conservatory out of bricks. Yeah, yeah. It's really it's it's a it's very odd. Anyway, it's a pub called the King Billy, um, and it's terrifying. <laughs> it's a terrifying. You know that scene in The Lion King, <laughs> where like there's that moment where it's like everything Simba. Everything the light touches. touches. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then it goes, but, but what about that place over there? That's the King Billy. We do not talk about that place. You must it's, never go it's, there, Simba. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a hub for um, rowdy, uh, scary locals. Dare I say, it's um, like the Moss Eisley of Exeter. Yeah. It's, it basically... I think it's where, and and I can see why, um, if there is any kind of animosity to be felt between locals and students of Exeter University or Exeter College, um, then that seems to be the hub for um, for those kind of people. Uh, um, it's also probably the people who, you know, voted Conservative because they don't follow politics and voted Leave uh, in Brexit because they're idiots. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's to be fair, it's also like, I think that the local people in Exeter probably view it as something yeah. of a safe haven from students. Because like, in the same way that we have student pubs where if we don't want to like mingle with people local to Exeter, like for example, in Spoons, um, we have yes. you know the campus bar. Whereas I think maybe for for, for the town people, the, the King Billy is like their safe place. Yeah. It's just always... You... You'll 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 be walking past on an evening, and let's say that we've been we've been singing something in the cathedral. We leave. We might have had a, a you know a quick pint in the George's Meeting House, which is a Weatherspoons just behind the cathedral. Um, and on your walk home, it might be half past nine, and you've got kind of very drunk, middle aged local men and women of Exeter dancing to let's say Jitterbug. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's just a it's a bizarre place. It's this melting pot of really culturally. I'm sure it's quite a fascinating place to kind of observe. The only problem is you can't observe it for very long because as soon as you pause for more than three seconds outside, a local will probably come up and uh, abuse you. Well, that's the thing. Like you do see fights break out relatively frequently outside. Oh yeah. Uh, and the other thing is the the mm. legend which I've been told and I have for some reason never deigned to test uh, is that if you go in and order a pint of milk, you'll get beaten up. Apparently that's. I think it really? might be an initiation or something for one I have, society. I have heard. I've, I've heard this. Yeah, it was probably rugby sock or something, wasn't it? Let's be. Let's be real here. Yeah. Um. But that's that's one of the uh, that's the the dark place in Exeter. It's the elephant's graveyard of the city. Yes. Um. But yeah. I mean, yeah. Thank God that J.K. didn't say she went there. Like, he, you know, yeah. like Will on the X. I've never actually been to. I've heard it's nice. And I used to, I, I go. I used to go there quite regularly in the summer. Um. It's really lovely. It sit, it's it's sits right next to the river. Mm. Um, it's car park floods it's, pretty it's badly. Really, when it's it, really when it floods. It's really yeah. It's really stunning though. Um, I think it's actually owned by the same company that owns um, on the waterfront and another uh, pub on Gandhi Street. I could believe it's that. It's a trio of yeah. I think it was mentioned as one of the places when I used to uh, before before I had my current job when I was a a waiter. Waiter delivering um, pizzas and assorted uh, munchable goodies. You said that with um, such disdain. A waiter delivering uh, pizza. Like, this is so oh beneath God. me. I mean, I say it with disdain because it was quite possibly the worst job I've ever had. Um, and I've worked in hospitality before. Um, Mate, your, your time and, as I a mean, pleasure it, boy it, does not count as hospitality. It's Yeah, no, I've, I've worked as a kind of like a waiter and barista before. And, and to be fair, I think the whole kind of hospitality kind of industry is just not for me i i really really didn't enjoy it I th- i'm sure there are there are pleasant workplaces and also i think it would be much nicer to work in kind of like a small you know like if you've got like a little cafe in a town or like a seasidey town and it's got a little thing and you do your little coffees and you do some sandwiches and stuff that'd be quite pleasant but right. as soon as it kind of upscales to something slightly larger it is just hell on earth um, so you you like the idea of the country file version of farming where it's all genteel and artisan yes. and like not at all like reality 
Whereas it, the the re- reality of farming, which is like the reality of serving, is just not for you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just... Well, yeah. Well, I know. I mean, I'm not sure whether I'm I'm not sure whether th- like the reality because the reality of farming is is like battery farming, isn't it? I think you can make you can make whatever you like, especially artisanal stuff. In you know, in the 21st century, 2018, if you're going to do anything artisanal, you're going to be fine, because people will pay extortionate amounts of money for oh are these chickens. Uh, they have their an entire coop per chicken. They get Saturday mornings off, and they get a massage every Sunday. <laughs> you could put that on a label, and people would be like, "Oh yeah, that's oh, that sounds really nice." That, that waitress will snap that up. I recently, I actually rewatched. Um, oh, what's it called? Cowspiracy. Recently, not heard of it. What's it? What's oh, it about? A, oh, you'd love it. It's really good. No, sorry. Oh no, um, no. Hang on. You cut um, out. All I heard then was I just watched recently. And I was like, I'd never heard oh, of a right. film called recently, but um, tss, I what see. did you actually say? <laughs> uh, Cowspiracy. No, I, I, I have heard of it, but I have not watched it. Um, I have. It's very good. I would put it up there as uh, up there with uh, Blackfish as uh, good documentary watches on Netflix. Was this Ellen's recommendation by any chance? No, this was something I watched in my first year huh. at uni um, and gave me cause to kind of go I didn't go full vegetarian but I only ate one like cow slightly meaty meal a day so like for instance my I would go I'd have like some I don't know like a sausage and some bacon for breakfast but then every other meal of the day I would make sure that it was vegetarian um or in some cases vegan depending on because I was in catered accommodation in my first year um the the options as far as kind of dietary requirements were concerned was really really good they actually did a superb job Mm. um but yeah, it's a it's a powerful piece of um, powerful piece of film produced by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Would you believe? Well, he's big into his activism, isn't he? I know he's mostly into is, his um, yeah. uh, it's global warming in particular that that's his uh, fight. But yeah, it- hence his hence his interest in this film because they say there's some incredible statistic where basically if you combined if you combine the emissions of the um, the transport industry, so uh, cars. Uh, motorbikes, buses, planes, trains, boats, um, the emissions of uh, the energy sector, um, all into one combined is less, considerably less than the emissions of um, animal industry. Yeah, I mean, like... It's insane. It's something ridiculous. Like, if you combine all of those statistics, the emissions um, in the year... That like a, that contributes for about twelve percent of greenhouse gases. Whereas if you look at the animal industry, it's something like forty-five or fifty. It's amazing. I, I um, don't know the statistics yeah. off the top of my head. I did I did a video about this once, um, where basically if you want to make an impact on, uh, if you want to change your climate impact, your impact on the environment, then the the single biggest thing you can do is to stop eating meat. Uh, which is why I'm vegetarian. I don't have an, a, a um, philosophical or an ethical problem with killing animals to eat them because that's kind of what animals do uh, to other animals. Mm. Um, I, I do it because it, it's the, uh, it slashes your, your carbon impact. Um, I, think, I think if you eat a lot of meat by going, uh, by which I mean, you know, like two or three times a day, um, I'm pretty sure you can, it's more than halving your carbon footprint by not eating mm. meat and yes i know there are arguments yeah. against it um and that uh, a lot of people say stupid things like you know uh, if you got rid of all of um all uh, meat farming then all these people would be out of a job and like the world economy would collapse it's like yeah if you did it overnight it would like it's it's mm. in the same way that the the economy of the usa like uh, uh whaling was the fifth biggest industry in america in the late stages of the 19th century like when moby dick was written um but mm. when the whaling industry stopped the usa didn't collapse like it's. I know that those yeah. two industries aren't exactly equivalent, but you know, it, it's ah, people have stupid arguments when it comes to arguing against this. And honestly, at some point, you have to just sort of slap people and say, "What? What do you want? Do you want to argue about the, like the minutiae and the, the tiny little details, or do you want to actually do something to save the planet and save all the species going mm. extinct every day?" Um, I've actually I found um, I found some of the statistics on the uh, Cowspiracy website. Oh, okay. Uh, one of which. Uh, livestock and their byproducts account for at least 32 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, CO2, per year, or 51% of all worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. 51%? 51%. Yeah. 
Mm. Now that methane is um, what that statistic doesn't make sense. That's I was about to say because these are from Cowspiracy, I would take these with a pinch of salt. Oh. Like I oh no no no, I'm reading a different statistic. That it's it they're they're all they're all um. You can you can read all the studies underneath. It's just the way that they formatted another statistic, and the the way that they formatted means the the question doesn't read as a question. Ah, I see. So it should be methane is twenty five to a hundred times more destructive than CO two CO two on a twenty year time frame. Yeah, th- th- this is when you start getting into the sort of nitty gritty of um, uh, you know, of, of forcing the climate because yes, methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas. Um, in the same way that water is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than than CO two. Um, so yeah, it, it, there there will be some metric, and I don't I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head that will uh, combine sort of the it, it will weight you know uh, say if CO two is one forcing unit then methane will be five forcing units so if you emit five times as much carbon dioxide as methane they're going to have the same impact um, yeah uh, so I don't know the name of that off the top of my head so yeah if you account for how destructive methane is then. Um, mm. sorry not destructive how how much radiative forcing um, methane has on the climate system then yeah I could believe that it's closer to half mm. um, but yeah that this is this is we've gone all cheery again Dan we've we've mm. we've really gone all cheery yeah um it, it is worth watching though I think like to, to kind of to, to move on swiftly um it is it is worth watching purely from um it's it's thought provoking but it's also quite a well-made documentary mm. Um, it's been like it's it's actually had some kind of creative thought put into to the kind of cinematography process, uh, yeah. which is always a always a good thing. Well, speaking uh, speaking of sort of being critical about these things, should we take a, a hop, skip, and a, a jump over into critics' corner so we can talk about this and a few other big uh, things that have happened this week uh, a bit more fully? Sure. All right, all right, all right. So the big thing, obviously, that happened this week in in terms of criticism. Oh wait, can we? Sorry, can we? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Can we start the section again? I just really need to blow my nose, and I want to have a moment where it's not going to be on the audio. Yeah, sure. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, also, fun uh, funny thing happened. You know, when we were talking about emojis, yeah, I dropped out of the call for about thirty seconds. I don't know if you noticed. Oh, <laughs> clearly not. Um. It's fine. It, you cut. You can't tell in the audio. But my mum called. <laughs> my mum called my phone. It cut you off the call. Um, I declined her. I sent her a message saying I'm recording. I'll call you later. And then just dropped back in. And you were still going on about emojis. And I just like flawlessly jumped out and back in. So basically, what you're saying is you contribute so little to this podcast that you weren't even there. <laughs> I didn't notice. Well, I didn't want to. You were on a. You were on a. You were on a, a roll with the uh, the white faced emoji thing. Um, Great, but yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite pleased that I managed to do that without any interruption because obviously it would have. Yeah, it, uh, it took so much skill. Would have ruined you. your flow. <laughs> it clearly, took so much skill. I mean, given that I'm doing it all off the same phone, yes, it did take quite a bit of skill. You didn't do anything. All, all, all that was was luck. <laughs> I mean, my phone is right next to the microphone for one thing, so all the vi- I, I, I had it in my hand just as it started to vibrate, as it were. Um, Anyway, you'll you'll listen back and you'll realise he actually did manage to cover that up pretty well. All right, okay. Well, when I uh, this critics' corner. Yeah. Okay. So last week we discussed um, Darkest Hour. We were we were going. You suggested mm. that we should go and see Darkest Hour, and then we I floated the idea that we should do a Patreon Google Hangout. Um, yes. Now I'm based on the the feedback from that, like emails and Patreon posts. Uh, people seem very keen for that. So I think mm. sometime it might actually be next week. I think um, because I've got my PhD Viva next week, so it might be something because okay. I'll be down in Exeter, so we might actually just be able to hang out on a sofa somewhere and then live stream mm. the two of us. So we sh- we'll have to be selective with the day because it is um, it's GNS week show week. Yeah, so the, the yes. we will we will pick our our time. Uh, that, well, and if it doesn't happen mm. next week, we will do something uh, the following week. We'll, we'll make it happen basically. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Partly because Dan hasn't seen the film yet, um, but he has been busy. I mean, you keep you keep labouring this point. Not on the podcast, I haven't. I've Not been, yet. <laughs> I've I've been in credit. Oh, okay. So, so for 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 listeners, uh, when uh, just before Simon and I were calling, um, uh, or started recording rather, 
um, we were just kind of updating each other on what we've doing. And uh, my update of saying like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, it's the week before, it's the week before the show, I've been really f***ing busy. Also, singers are trying to prep for a tour to Italy. You did not mention uh, the tour. Works back <laughs> and uni... I've but you know how much how the sheer amount of like the stupid number of things that I'm trying to do on campus at the moment and then got antsy that I couldn't go and see the film given that you've just handed in your PhD and you have a little bit more free time now I have my Viva next week I have I was in Exeter this week I had to get an hour yeah you were I was you, traveling for an hour and a half to get house. to the cinema <laughs> It'll be done. I, sh- I shall. Uh, I'll definitely want. Well, I mean, this is the thing. It's not like I don't want to go and see it. I'm really, really excited to see it. It's that and that. What's that other one that I mentioned last week that I can never remember the name Three of? Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yes, that's the one. Okay, well, so that makes this next section kind of interesting because um, the the Oscar noms were announced uh, yesterday. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have you had a chance to review the uh, the list yet. Not as yet. Right. I'm going to have a look. I will now. send you a link to the BBC article with. Uh, all the noms now how many of these films do you think you'll have seen um because we're both on, we're both very interested in films but mm. uh a lot of these i haven't seen yet the rest of... okay i mean i i i will i have an <laughs> i have at least one issue with one of the nominations let's put it like that okay so for have you on the article yes right so for best picture um yeah. I mean, we were we sort of vaguely talked about this quite a few episodes ago, and we hypothesised that Dunkirk would get nominated, which it, it has been, mm. um, and a lot of other mm-hmm. films. I think one of our readers suggested Call Me by Your Name and Lady Bird mm. would be nominated, which they both were. So props to you, whoever that was. Mm-hmm. Get Out has been nominated, and then Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri has been nominated, uh, which. Uh, from everything I've heard is fantastic Darkest Hour has been nominated I don't think it deserves to be nominated for Best Picture personally um, The Post has been nominated uh, which I do need to see especially having met Tom Hanks now talking about the film um, and the mm. one that's got the most nominations with 13 is The Shape of Water has been nominated which I am really keen to see that's meant to be really good because it's Guillermo that's meant to be really good it's Guillermo del Toro um Mm. So, I mean, I've really liked his previous stuff. So very, very keen to see that. I don't think I actually think it's out yet. I think it's like quite a few of these mm. haven't been released. Oh, and, and Get Out. I, n- I still didn't. I hadn't seen. So, yeah. No, nor have I. Um, and then in terms of the acting ones. Um... In terms of the acting ones, they're all films. No, 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 no. That was moving on and on to the next categories of categories. Yes. Of, of yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just being an idiot. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, right? admittedly, I haven't seen... A lot of these performances so i can't say um i do think that based on darkest hour gary oldman is in with a very strong shout of getting the best actor oscar having not seen any yeah. of the films that he's been compared to um mm. but you know and then and then we've got like other um the supporting actors and stuff uh interesting that for um Best Director, Greta Gerwig, has been nominated. And I think it's something like the only only the fifth time a woman's been nominated for Best Director. It's well, kind of interesting. And then Christopher Nolan's been... I mean, they're not surprises, the people that have been nominated for these films. Like, Dunkirk, Get yeah. Out, and Shape of Water would have all been nominated for Best Director and Best Picture. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's probably going to be one of those nights where it'll probably be Del Toro will, will sweep it. Though I do think Dunkirk I don't think get... I don't think Nolan deserves Best Director. Why? It's a very good film. But from from a director's perspective, and especially given that it's it's Nolan, I feel like there are other there are other directors in that category who did more uh, kind of intuitive, challenging stuff. So, of the other four films, how many have you seen? Um, none. But I've seen the trailers <laughs> for Shape of Water. But you can tell. Okay. 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 So, so if so you look at the trailer, at, you... Oscars as <laughs> decided by Dan Moore. I mean, you raise a very good point. The trailers serve absolutely uh, no purpose in informing on the film. Oh, hang on. Yes, of course they do because they're trailers. That's the they're point. meant to sell the film. You it doesn't tell you anything you about the directing. The fi- okay. Okay then. Okay. So if you looked at if you looked at the um, if you looked at the trailer for I don't know uh film a and the trailer for good film b and you hadn't seen the film you'd have a pretty good idea of which director might have more artistic merit. all right okay i have two words for you that completely destroy that point which is Zack snyder okay Zack snyder films are terrible but they always make quite convincing trailers like that is just th- okay. that's the way he makes films so would you okay okay well i would i'd stand by the fact that i i feel like um Certainly, from 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 the limited 
amount of what I've seen from The Shape of Water, I feel like it's a more interesting, like cinematic experience than Dunkirk was in, was impressive. But I don't think it was a special from a from a directorial perspective. It's gonna. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if it wins best best picture. But from a di- from a director's perspective, I feel like Nolan. Eh. I don't know. I think I think one of the things that impressed me most about Dunkirk was how how consistent isn't the word but how as a unit as a whole experience it was so coherent and together you know and it was it it clearly Mm. had somebody who was a master of their craft connecting all the dots bringing all the production together and making it feel like a continuous whole that is the role of a director like that that is what a director does they direct the action in front of and behind the camera so Mm. i don't know to me i think that's completely deserved that he gets nominated i wouldn't be surprised if he gets he gets the win. I don't know. I don't know if he's won. Yeah, won I mean, I think it also. I think. I think something has to be said for like a, a, a you know, arguably one of the one of the biggest parts of the of of what a director does is just the kind of the overall vision of the film, which you get an idea of within the first like, you know, five minutes of watching something on screen. You you kind of you settle into how everything is being presented to you. Um, I see. I take your point. Um. So, uh, but I still, I still feel that I've just been looking through Go his um, Wikipedia page. This is the first time he's actually been nominated for best director, which I didn't realize. Yeah, there he, you go. He's re- he has received eight noms before, including best picture and for best picture and for screenplay. Um, and yeah. his films have have got a total of thirty four nominations and seven wins. So like oh, he's go. got four. But he's, I didn't realize he'd never been nominated before. That's kind of interesting. Um, I think this is the first year of nominations where i i've i like i haven't seen really anything that's being nominated i mean in, in seen... our defense a lot of them haven't come out yet like the shape of water isn't yeah. available yet i don't think phantom thread is i don't think um the post is out here yet like a, a lot of these uh, through billboards is i think but yeah a lot of them just haven't come out yet here yeah so i don't I think, think it's why, I, I mean like the the oscars are the oscars aren't they like this is this is one of the this is something that you know, I know that um, Mark Kermode never never puts a great deal of stock into uh, nominations and wins at the Oscars. Mm. Um, it's it's far more interesting to see, you know, what what did well at the kind of the, the smaller independent film festivals. Yeah, um, which is you know, I mean, which to be fair is like uh, I I can when I was a kid, and by kid I mean like teenager. Um, I definitely thought of that as a very pretentious way of looking at films. Like, oh, this film won the the mm. the, the crying monkey at the Venice Film Festival. Like, oh, it's the best thing ever. Mm. I was much more interested in which one best picture because at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, the Oscars are like populist cinema, really like good yeah. populist cinema, but truly like artistic stuff does take place at those tiny film festivals. Like, the older I get, the more I, c- I come yeah. around to that point of view. Yeah. But but what I think is interesting is there's a, there's a couple of other highlights. We won't talk about this for too much longer, um, readers who don't like films. Um, t- a couple of other interesting points. Best Adapted Screenplay, um, Logan mm. was nominated, which I think is great. I, th- I mm. thought that had a fantastic yeah, that's a, screenplay. That's a good shout. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I haven't seen any of the other films. Um, the Disaster Artist is also nominated in the, the same category. But I just I just think it's great that Logan's actually mm. been nominated for, for anything because I, th- I really did like that film. Mm. I thought it was great. Um and then uh, later on, best original score. What are your thoughts? I think it's oh. so to get, to give the readers the nominations. The best original score nominations are Dunkirk, Phantom Thread, The Shape of Water, Star Wars: The Last Jedi, and Three, three Billboards Outside Emming, Missouri. You've got three very heavy hitting names there. Yeah, <laughs> Zimmer, Desplat, and Williams, and, like, and Carter Burwell has been around. I, for I haven't seen well. the. I haven't seen the. Sh- I haven't seen The Shape of Water. I'm very obviously quite a big fan of Alexander Desplat because I think he the soundtracks he's done for the uh, Potter franchises were really good and different. Um, he really kind of he he works kind of a narrative into his into his music. Writing. How do you pronounce his name? Um, Is it? I thought it was like Desplat rather than. I don't know. You just definitely said say, Alexandra say Desplat. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm gonna. Say, well, I'm sticking with Desplat. Um, I'm uh, I'm not French. <laughs> um, I think. Oh, it could be it could be Zimmer, you know. That score is pretty powerful. I don't know. I don't think you'll um, get it. I mean, I, I but I, it weigh, but it weighs so heavily on pre existing music. Yeah. Um, you know, like the the the, the scenes are the most that are the most powerful are the ones that feature Elgar's Nimrod. So 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, it's not really a nomination for Zimmer. I don't think um, Zimmer or Williams will get it. I don't think the score for the Last Jedi was that good. Although there was that interestingly that sideways video, remember about how he wrote it and then they edited the film to it. So, yeah, but yeah, I didn't notice the music at all, which really should say that it was a good soundtrack. But I don't know. I, I think if you won the other three, you that really need to see you. the other three. Yeah, Phantom Thread, Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I'm de- I'm really keen to see that last one. I keep, I'm really keen to see. Keen. It. I think it's gonna it's got to be a picture house. Um, yeah picture house viewing because phantom thread is the one with daniel day lewis in because he's nominated i noticed for best actor for that yes which is hardly surprising given his back catalogue but i'm keen to see that for that reason basically um and then quick and we've got quickly um, moving on best animated features yeah boss baby was given a f***ing oscar yeah. nomination what the actual f- yeah ridiculous. well coco's gonna win that it's got if it doesn't go if it doesn't go to loving vincent um uh, yeah it's between it's, bet- it's between coco and loving vincent yeah and then are two like like kind of two very quick points to finish up actually no maybe there's two or two or three um very quickly best cinematography i i've learned that rachel morrison is the first person ever first woman ever to be nominated for that category isn't that amazing hmm. like yeah how long it's taken and of course roger deakins has been nominated again i really hope he gets it this year like blade runner was gorgeous mm. blade runner's got quite a few nominations actually which is good to see um on the technical mm. side of things um I think he could uh, it, well certainly I think it personally I think it was better shot than Dunkirk I think it was better shot than Darkest Hour so I can't say about the other two um, but give the yeah. man his Oscar it's also nominated for best production design I think if anything is going to take it it's got to be Blade Runner um, Blade Runner yeah. uh, it was just in a, you know just purely in an exercise of you know like in an exercise of world building yeah can't not win yeah I'd, I'd be i'd be really quite surprised if it doesn't win that and then um another oh my god kong skull island has been nominated for best visuals i mean i have did you see it yeah oh uh, what did you think of the the special effects just, just nothing nothing particularly noteworthy at all oh okay in that it all just kind of looks kind of like it looks passable your your, your suspension of disbelief is never broken but it's got to do a fair bit more than that hmm Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two has been nominated. That was pretty good looking. I would be surprised uh, if Blade Runner wins that one for the threesome uh, with the um, the hologram. That's yeah. such a weird sentence. I still haven't. I still haven't seen Twenty Forty Nine. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Difficult category to call that. Oh, ah, no, I wouldn't be surprised if Planet of the Apes takes it because just uh, yeah. admittedly, I'm going to say something which I just lambasted you for based on the visuals in the trailer. So, yeah. cue gales of laughter there um it does yeah. look incredibly impressive what they've what they've yeah, achieved it do, it's it's a good looking it's a good it, i've seen it it is a good looking film editing and sound editing both of which uh, baby driver has been nominated for both and sound mixing um yeah all, all three sound categories i i mean i wouldn't be surprised if like dunkirk might take one of those because sound was used really effectively yeah um but mm, just please, for the love of God, don't let the Last Jedi win anything. It doesn't deserve to win any Oscars. Mm. It really doesn't. Like, did the Force Awaken even win anything? I think it lost out to Ex Machina or Ex Machina, as Michael likes to say. Um, yeah, Ex Machina. Uh, when it when it came to the visual effects, I don't think it won any Oscars. Uh, mm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm just gonna have a quick. Oh, oh no, it did win for best visual effects. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it it received five nominations and one win. So, hmm. um, oh yeah, no, it doesn't deserve to win that, doing that. But yeah, um, so it's interesting. Um, I, I, I think that like there's the I'm very, very keen to catch up on a lot of these films. Um, but and yeah, ba- yeah. based on based on what I think of Dusk is I reckon it will win two. I reckon it'll get best actor and it'll get best makeup because Gary Oldman is hmm. literally unrecognizable. You'd never yeah. know it was him apart from like one or two shots. We are like, oh my god, he looks like Gary Oldman. Um, yeah. But yeah, very very impressive stuff. Is that? Do you think we've talked about films for long enough this time? I, I have sometimes I conscious think, uh, that like Critics Corner is too short. So <laughs> yeah, I think we might have. Uh, I think we might have hit it. Okay, well, okay. So those of you, hello, those of you who don't like films, hello, wake we're, up, wake, wake up, up, come back. Right, we're back, back, and we're going to go into yes. Agony Corner, which doesn't alliterate. Sorry. <laughs> Somebody did email about that. They suggested that we could call it Crisis Corner. That's not bad. Uh, which we might actually have to take them up on. Um, so yeah, because otherwise everything else, uh, everything else alliterates, and the lack of it does rankle my soul. <laughs> but we do have a submission. Um, you read out the submission last time, didn't you? 
I did, I did. Okay. Take it away. So we have a submission for anon- from Anonymous this time, um, which is, I think, a rather, rather deep one. So settle in, settle in, boys and girls, and whatever you choose to identify as. Um, uh, Anonymous writes, My problem lies in the dilemma of doing what one is good at versus doing what one loves. I've always been a competent writer and a keen reader, and thus traditional English education, both language and literature, has come pretty naturally. What I'm saying is I've been able to keep a steady A or A star level of attainment through GCSE and A level. This is by no means a brag. I have my own reservations about the way in which such ability is quantified and standardised. I'm simply saying that taking English to higher education hasn't been a particularly strenuous endeavour for me, nor indeed has it been something that I haven't enjoyed. My issue, however, lies with mathematics. Boy, do I empathise with you. I barely scraped an A at GCSE and then a B at A level, and both were with maximum effort. Ordinarily, one may excuse a discrepancy in one's mathematical and literary performance due to the subjects requiring different types of minds. This is a point I hear endlessly. You're either one or the other. But I must insist that I truly love maths. Ever since I was young, the rush of solving a problem has been something unparalleled by any other subject, and I have adored devouring question after question, becoming faster and more agile in adapting and applying laws and rules to particular cases. Specifically at A-level, differentiation, integration, logarithms, exponentials, and binomial expansions were my drug. And the best part is, I know I barely scratched the surface. I was never formally taught about complex or imaginary numbers, Euler's theorem, or any of the shit they cover in further maths. There's still a whole world out there left to explore. I just never felt capable of exploring it. Wow, God. This is a lot to read. Sorry, mm. sorry, readers. Uh, I'm, I'm become the reader. Honestly, a B at A level was the best I could do. I tried so f***ing hard. I got A's in both English language and literature and psychology with relative comfort because, frankly, writing essays is easy. If I approached maths with an equally cocky and arrogant attitude, I have no doubt that I would have come out with an E, but I pushed myself tirelessly to try to be better. Now, I've undertaken an English literature degree, and whilst, yes, I can read critically and produce adequate responses to classic literature, there's something about it that is distinctly unfil- unfulfilling. This is something that I haven't admitted to anyone, so I'm rather terrified right now. I'm confident in my ability to carry out this degree and make a success of it. With a bit of luck, I may even get a first. But nevertheless, this gaping void inside myself persists. I'm not good at maths, and yet I still have this urge to push myself to be better. Maybe it's because I think being good at maths is somehow inherently better than being good at English. I have no rational explanation for this inclination, but I fear it may be true. Will I ever be good enough? Will I ever find it within me to love something at which I'm actually capable? I feel awful for putting all of this on your shoulders. By all means, cast me aside, but I feel it be appropriate to seek guidance from someone who has undertaken a literature degree and one who has just completed a mathematical PhD. Between a rock and a hard place, anonymous. So, wow. Mm. This 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 is some heavy stuff. It touches on many things, doesn't it? I mean... The thing that kind of strikes me is that whenever kind of whenever English is referred to, uh, or li- well, literature, I should say, um, it's it's not with particular. I'm going to go with passion here. Mm. Um, it's like it's like it's been. I mean, I sympathise greatly because I never, with again, and this is not a brag. I never really had to try especially hard in English, with the exception of writing my extended essay in the IB. Mm. Um, and much like our anonymous reader, um, it was I, I, it was always uh, A's or in IB's, you know, sixes and sevens. And then I came out with a seven at high level English. Um, the thing is, I think certainly where the, the the difference that I noticed with with taking English literature at university level rather than uh, at, at school, um, certainly the difference between higher level English lit and IB and uni they're they're very much similar you're taught to write in a very different way namely um and i'm going to quote the email here um reading critically and producing adequate responses um the reason why it's unfulfilling is because that's kind of it's in it's in it's it's unfulfilling in the response that you're giving to you know and it's certainly part of i think one thing that's really tough about an english literature degree is that certainly the way that it's taught at exeter university is that you're given such an incre- incredible breadth in your first couple of years um that to to really lock in in lock into something that you you're deeply passionate about and and as such when writing a response um it's something that you really enjoy and you put a tremendous amount of thought into and you and you want to you want to provide something new and interesting rather than just you know, this actually kind of summarizes my way of 
of my relationship with classics at times when I'm writing an essay for for uh, I don't know Greek history or Greek and Roman drama um, it's very much that kind of I am writing I'm I'm reading critically I'm giving a response that raises the points that's needed to be raised but my heart isn't exactly in it which is the exact opposite when it comes to writing something for English um, it's reflected in the modules that I've taken everything I take for English usually revolves around poetry um, because that's my jam um, and I've just started this romanticism module that I'm taking, I think might be my favorite, not only module taken at university, but my favorite thing I've ever studied about English in the history of me knowing anything to do with English literature. It is genuinely fascinating that every, every aspect of, of, of this module, I absolutely adore. So I already, I can already pretty much say with confidence now that when it comes to writing my dissertation, it will be, it will be on um, some aspect of romanticism or the romantic era. Um, so, are you saying that it's uh, that it's only it, that the only option really is to follow what you're passionate about? I think if you're not, if you're taking something at university where and your heart isn't completely in it, you're making it you're making it that that bit more harder for yourself. Of course, and you know, and and our our anonymous uh, reader uh, says um, he's he's. Uh, I'm confident in my ability to carry out this degree and make a success of it. Um, that's fab, and that's good. And and it's also worth mentioning that university is about is is about more than just what you're doing at university. It's more than your degree. It's mm. a, you know you learn to know yourself more. You you try you you try to do different things. You've got the, the sheer number of extracurricular stuff that you can do. You know, like in in my case, and I'm sure Simon similarly with yours, um, being able to kind of fall in love with the English choral tradition. Was something that I didn't really have an opportunity to do to do in Australia, mm. uh, certainly. Likewise, in the Netherlands. Um, so, in that sense, you grow you grow more um, than than just what you're learning in your, in your degree. However, I do think it's incredibly important that some aspect of your degree, like if you're doing combined honours, like me, um, having some area where you you're you've got a true passion and feeling of excitement and like love for what you're learning about, which which seems to be the way that our reader is talking about mathematics you know i i was i've never been good at maths and i had to try i had to absolutely work my testicles off <laughs> to to uh, to get a good score in my um in my maths uh, my maths ib and fortunately i did i i just differed in the sense that i knew as soon as i walked out of that exam that's the end of my relationship with maths i'm i'm done now i've put it in i've come out with a score that I'm, i was very happy with um the work paid off, but that was it now. That's it, because I don't have an interest in it. And what I did have an interest in, I wanted to pursue at university. Um, it might be worth considering whether at Exeter, if you take, if you take not even necessarily a flexible combined honours degree, but you can do a cross, um, a, like a cross college module. So you could be studying economics and politics, but take a module in ancient history or a module in geography or, you know, um, it's just it's just one of the things they allow you to do i'm sure and other universities do it too maybe what you need is like what i get out of um poetry there's some aspects of classics like the greek history module i'm doing at the the moment um where it gets really heavy and if it weren't for moments where of, of kind of light relief with areas of english that i find super interesting um then i probably wouldn't be having as fun a time or it would be it would be considerably more grating. So maybe that's something to to consider. See if you can take a module in 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 maths. They should count it as a credit. Um, that's what so university is you, about, right? So your advice is to continue with the English that the uh, our reader is doing and as a degree, but see if maths can be incorporated in that in some way. I mean, I, I give that advice because to completely change is to, to to completely change the degree. While that, I mean, it's a it's just a it's a very big thing to do, mm. you know. Course. Um, it's a it's a it's a kind of big. Ch- also, it, it you you may reach a point where you can't actually do that, and you would have to start your course again. Like for instance, in my uh, second year, when I wanted to do less um, language from my classic side, I I thought about seeing whether I could just transfer just to pure English, and I could do that. But if I wanted to do that, I'd have to go back into my first year um, because I missed out on the critical theory modules that I would have needed for resuming in second year um 
So it's I don't know it's 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 really tough I think and it's and it can be it can feel incredibly daunting if you feel like oh maybe I've made the wrong made the wrong decision here. I think your answer lies in there's so much more to to an English literature degree than you think. There's so much and and it, and, and it, you just need to f- you need to pick modules that on the surface may look like completely the wrong ones to take. The only reason I took this romanticism module was because um, there's poets of the time that I quite like, but most importantly, they say the module convener um, is my favourite lecturer at university. I think she's uh, she's unbelievable, and the university is lucky to have her. Um, that's why I took it, and it just so happened that while while enjoying her lectures, um, the 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 uh, the information being presented is ludicrously exciting it's just like ev- literally every aspect not just the literature but like the history of the time the science and politics going on at the time the philosophy at the time like every every lens that you could possibly look at this period of english i am fascinated by you need to find that you need to find that kind of area for either in your english or keep playing it safe with the modules you're taking and make a success of it and in the meantime as your light relief and something that you can you can do to provide some more interest or more passion try and take a module that's different try and see if you can go and go and study under another college take another module the the universe certainly at exeter you can do that it's just a case of timetabling um I mean, that would be my advice. That's a very long-winded advice. I'm sorry, I kind of had a rant there. But, I mean, to briefly um, add my two cents to that, um, I, the advice I always give to everybody when it comes to a conflict of interest like this is that life is much too short to do anything other than what you are passionate about. Um, yeah. However, as Dan says, um, so much of university is about much more than the subject you're taking it's about all the other stuff that you get along with it and so in that sense yes. um i can't remember if our reader has said at what level i think are they in the first year or second year um, i'm not sure if, if, well, to be fair if you're in the degree i think my advice would be to basically to to stick it out if possible as dan says incorporate some maths in that if you can do combat um flexible combined honors fantastic um or if not there'll be a math society on campus you know you can you can do the stuff in your own in in your own time to keep up with you know research interests and things like that you can go to public lectures i mean i believe i'm right in saying that anyone can go to any set of lectures right at university so if If you're enrolled at the university you can you you can go into anything yeah so you could just sit at the back of lectures if you wanted to if you want and then based on that maybe that would be enough to you know decide whether or not it's it's something you want to pursue it might be that you're like actually you know at this level I, it's not for me if however it is for yeah. you i would like, like i say stick it out um because uh, you, if you are confident that you can do this degree to the best of your abilities and come up with a good grade uh, two one or mm. a first then i take that um and then after university i would look into something like the open university or some kind of adult education course um because something that i've learned from a lot of subscribers messaging me is that it's never too late to to yeah. to learn um so so many people are asking me about mature courses um and those are just the people who want to do it formally at university um on, like at a campus university so it might well be that it's possible for you to do your english degree come out and then you obviously have the associated effects of that you're more employable you have something something that demonstrates you know your abilities in these uh in in uh, the skills that are required to do an english degree um and so, you know, you have that. It's not exactly a, a safety net, but you have that as your ammunition. And then on top yeah. of that, you can go and study um, what you're passionate about uh, in the evenings, in your spare time. Or if you wanted to do, you know, like like the Open University, for example, in a slightly more formal way. Um, but I think the important thing is to not let go of what you are passionate about. Um, the practicality yes. of the situation is, I think, that you should be sticking out at university at the moment. But as much as is possible indulging your love for maths and then afterwards look into options to do it formally mm. so uh yeah both rather, relatively long-winded answers from the two of us yeah i think it's also important to say like it's meant you you say i feel awful awful for putting this on your shoulders don't for one and also you you um, the person mentions that this is something that they haven't spoken about before mm. um two points that's exactly what this kind of agony uncle part is for we can't guarantee you know like 
it's only our opinions and advice we're giving it's not kind of instructions on what you should do yeah. but if there's anything where you've, you you know like you want to talk about it to someone but you want to kind of remain have have still have a degree of anonymity um then this is perfect but don't i don't, don't let it stress you out um really it's it's really good that you can have this conversation and you've got these thoughts going through because it ultimately means that you care tremendously about what you're doing at university you know you're not being complacent um yeah see what you can do see 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 kind of ha- give give what simon said and what i've said i think and maybe maybe it help maybe you know maybe if you maybe you're in your coming to the end of your first year um and uh and you want to just change course and you might be able to do that you might be able to pick up straight into a second year without having having the basics if you know you never know um but i certainly think that you know flexible combined honors route it's there for a reason um and it sounds like exactly the kind of reason you're describing so, and i completely sympathize with you it's you're describing very much what i went through um and it worked for me so so if you are very lucky you might end up like dan yeah that's either that or just join a choir mate that's the <laughs> that's the answer just let music just just let music take over your life that's what i've done and uh join a choir to impress a girl i'm uh, i'm just i'm barely holding it together it always works out well all right, all right, all right, all right. Are you shitting all over my dick? Oh my god. I could... Oh. Hello, readers. You join us at an unfortunate juncture in the history of the Wikicast where we have just gone through quite... We've been talking for about 20 minutes. Oh, I don't think it was 20 minutes. Dan had gone for a pee. Think... Oh, don't, don't try I mean, and diminish I this, will. I know. Well, I'm boy. diminishing. I, I f***ed up. It wasn't 20 minutes. We were just talking for at least 20 minutes. Okay. And Dan... Sure was not recording yeah which is ironic because we just noticed this in a question about how we record the podcast yeah hooray. so guess guess what we're going to go through the next couple of emails with the utmost enthusiasm yeah that, that's a thing thank you mate yeah that's it's all not right like we both got things to do <laughs> i mean it's, it's very true we both have things to do like you, you speed through these right so sure right. okay so Haley, we did actually talk about your your email quite a lot but Haley martin that's you Haley martin from I, scotland yeah we really like you. your email here we go yeah it was really really great um you congratulated simon on your thesis and and, and but doing his viva um you're doing a first year engineering in physics and physics you nice. have to be like two years at college and it like didn't go great in the first year but then absolutely oh. smashed it in the second year and now you're hey. back at uni and you're a little bit older but that's okay because that's all that's that's all right being older is fine as simon will attest mm-hmm. um uh you spoke about the amazing um scottish road gritters and how they all have names uh some such names as sir salter uh, sir salter scott mr plow and gritty gritty bang bang which is amazing and sir andy flurry and gary gritter those are my two other favorites yeah we we launched into extensive conversation about uh your fashion question uh, namely saying that mine was majestic we both gave our advice it basically boils down to think about colors don't wear too much um and the difference between fashionable and stylish there's um, a YouTube channel called Real um, Ren, uh, Real Men Real Style. I know that you're probably not a, a gentleman based on y- your name, but like that was where I got my point about the difference between fashion and style from. So that's mm. it, that might be worth a look. Yeah. Uh, you also said that you're looking forward to the idea of merchandise, which is just very exciting. We are as well. And the idea of badges. Um, we can have um, two and put one of our heads on each one, uh, which would be kind of, kind of funny. Um, Sorry, Done. it's not right. going to be answered in full. We did, did we had like a, a very lengthy discussion about it, but I'm an idiot and couldn't record. But somebody f***ed it up. So okay, uh, Nathan Smith, you also sent us an email. Yeah, yes, he did. Uh, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan. Um, he's an Aussie. We have another Australian listener. We found out that we have like 1,000 listeners in Australia, which is actually like kind of amazing. Um, he's been mm. in, he's been without internet for five months. Dear God, I said I would have died, and I just said it again. Um, but uh, since getting the internet back, um, he has been listening to us nonstop whilst driving around. Keep up the great work, guys. The stupid humour always makes me laugh. I said that it's just as well you like the stupid humour because we can't do any other kind of humour. Dan, what's the next email? Let's go. The next email uh, was from Hugo. Uh, Hugo, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the second parts of your name because he says uh, not to he's got it it's yes. hugo, hugo i'm gonna give this a stab hugo gerbich pice because gerbich is he says is anglicized croatian and pice is spanish i think it means um uh world i want to say because el pice is the so. is the main newspaper um wait el, no isn't world mundo uh isn't that 
Uh, oh, the country. That's it. El Pais is the country. Yes, I think Mundo is world. Yeah. You're quite right. He goes on to say, recently found your podcast. I'm addicted. Keep, keep up the amazing work. I have a couple of questions for each of you. Uh, to Miss Moore, I'm a high school student and think I'd like to study either classics, classics in English, or classics in a modern language. I was wondering whether you'd still recommend classics in English after going down that path. And if you could share your experience, I'd greatly appreciate it. I think it's, with classics, certainly my experience, go for... Go for combined honours. Go for go do something with it because sometimes it can get quite heavy. So I think probably the most interesting pairing would be uh, classics and modern languages because you know ancient language for, informs greatly on modern, but also it would provide a nice juxtaposition between what you're studying and you'll always be greeted with something new in between each of your different lectures. To Simon, to Mrs. Clark. Hello. Uh, how how and where do you record the podcasts and how many readers does the podcast have and where do they come from? I'm Mrs. Uh, Nesbit. Sorry, that's that's a that's a retro reference. Wow, um, that's uh, Toy Story Toy Story One. Yeah, yeah, uh, Buzz Lightyear, right? Buzz Lightyear. I'm a sham. Years at yeah. the academy wasted. Um, how and where nice. do we record the podcast? So we went into this in some detail. It boils down to we both record locally, um, and we t- so, and we hear each other by um, talking on Discord uh, through our phones because mm-hmm. Dan's had some technical mm-hmm. problems in the past, and I actually can't record mm-hmm. onto my computer. So we have to do like two parallel systems where we can hear each other by the call, and then I record onto um, a Zoom H4N via a Rode NT1A. I like how I like how Dan's had some technical import um, problems in the past, and then you breeze over the fact that you physically can't record into your computer, which but is I arguably s- a bigger technical problem. No, but the system I have in place works absolutely fine, whereas because I haven't had an the alternative. System, it works, the the it system works, you it, attempted it works fine. didn't work. It works fine because you have no alternative. That Your system works because that's all you can do. Which means that it's a fine system. Your system that you attempted okay. didn't work. We're going to be bitching at each other for the rest of this podcast, I can uh, just tell. I think we are. There's, there's, a, there's a great deal of tension yeah, on the call, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, um, yeah, um, I, record, I record in the front room under the stairs. Simon records, his, records in the granny annex. Uh, yes, I record in the granny annex. Uh, onto H4N, he records onto his laptop. We transfers me the footage, and then I um, edit it together in Premiere. And yes, I know, Alex, if you're listening, I sh- uh, some people think that I should be doing this in Audition, not Premiere. I am way faster in Premiere because I live my life in Adobe Premiere and I can edit very quickly. That's why I do it that way. And then in terms of how many um, readers we have, um, we get about, it's between 1,500 and 2,000 downloads per episode within a couple of weeks. And that actually, recent, the last one got 2,000 within its first week. Um, so... Uh, in, I'd, I'd describe us as having about 2,000 readers in total so it's quite an exclusive club really which we are trying to grow mm. um, particularly you know thanks to our um, um, you know fantastic p- supporters on Patreon um, we're going to hopefully be able to get people in um, mm. to sort of spread the word the good word the wikicast um, and uh, maybe catch up with people like Hello Internet because that's the other thing is like I know my only reference point is that Hello Internet gets somewhere in the region of a million downloads per episode like and that's that's a figure i was told once without any kind of anything backing that up so i don't know if that's actually correct but like yeah. that's my only reference point is one of the very biggest podcasts in the world so i have no idea whether we're doing okay or like whether we're still a minnow so you know two thousand per episode i think it's pretty good if i think if i was to have a youtube channel where i uploaded every week and i got two thousand views per week i would be pretty mm-hmm. pleased with that really like that's that's a pretty good community yeah so that, and where do they come from? Everywhere. See, mo- I think most of the UK. Am I right in saying like about fifty percent UK? Yeah, most. Yeah, most of the UK, and then the next largest, I think, is America, and then Australia, and then it, then it, then everywhere else is pretty similar. So we've got quite quite a lot in Asia, South America, um, Africa. Actually, it's yeah, uh, UK, America, Australia, Canada, and then kind of Asia and South America. Yeah, we definitely have a large Australian contingent, um, mm. uh, which is, I think, large. I, I, I choose to believe it's all the people that you knew when you were in Australia and <laughs> yeah. like, or their friends. I, and props to uh, California and Texas. You are the two the, the, the two states with the highest listenership. Uh, now, New York is in third place. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Hang on. States by population size, uh, because I, I would almost bet that, that they're just the states with... Um, the most population mm. uh yeah uh, california is the largest then texas then florida then new york yeah so 
Yeah, that that's that's uh, it's like uh, XKCD did a map about this where it was like they, mm. you can show like a map of incidents of people drowning in bathtubs and then mm. like in uh, f- uh, density or like number of primary schools and the two maps yeah. will look identical because that's where the people are. Um, so you mm. could argue from that that oh you know primary schools cause people to drown in their bathtub. Obviously it's it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, shout out to California and Texas for not drowning us in your bathtub. That was the conclusion, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> of course, if you do, as readers, wish to help us grow the mighty nation of of Wikicastia, is that the thing? What what we do? We, we have oh the readership. Grow the readership. That's it. Um, yeah. And of course, tell your friends about us, and and you know maybe recommend a particular episode. What episode do you reckon's one of our best? We we did one the other day that was like really good. I thought. Yeah, um, that was Tunnels of Gibraltar. I think it might have been the one before that I'm thinking of. I think it might have been the Super Bowl, I think, was a particularly good one. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, maybe if, do you recommend us to a friend. We should have some kind of referral scheme. Um, yeah. But, you know, only if you want to. I mean, to be honest, if you recommend it to somebody and they like it, jobs are good and like you've won. Whereas if you recommend it to someone and they don't like it and they stop being friends with you because of your terrible recommendation, they were a terrible friend in the first place who had terrible taste. Yeah. So, you know, you're So what we're anyway. saying is it's a win win to talk about the podcast to everyone you know exactly exactly oh and then lastly on that email um hugo you um ramble for a bit about uh darkest hour but as we said earlier we're going to do a live stream talking about that but i do want to focus on your point about yes. lily james um who's like kind of our window into the world who is excellent uh really great understated performance it helps that she's insanely pretty and like it hurts to look at her um much like pixel girl i hasten to add um when she's not pixelated like when she is pixelated she looks like a bunch of squares um but when she's not pixelated um she looks much like lily james so um yeah um just to just to highlight that point um uh, at this stage i yeah very good very good point hugo i've just seen your tweet <laughs> you little bitch <laughs> Next up, then, uh, we're, we're now going into new territory that we haven't already covered. Um, we're uh, looking at Liam Edwards' email uh, about uh, uh, titled On the Latest Star War. Hello, Simon and Dan. I hope you're both well. After episode 19, I held my tongue regarding The Last Jedi, but I cannot hold it any longer. I want to express my uncompromising support and adoration for this film. You're in a bold move there you are a bold one uh general edwards um having heard the film being bashed and trashed by a lot of people i feel like the film doesn't get the credit it deserves yes it has flaws but my god how can anyone watch this film and think it's worse than the intricacies of intergalactic trade law and anakin's hatred of sand it is better than the prequels i would absolutely say that um so they make the following points admiral holdo yes she is flawed and that she doesn't tell poe the plan but it was previously shown that Leia wants Poe to learn a valuable lesson about leadership. Holdo tries to teach him this lesson but makes mistakes along the way. Um, what do you think about that point? Um, I'm not sure I agree to be honest. In saying that she tries to teach him a lesson, you agree with it just being believable that that would happen in that scenario and it totally wouldn't happen in that scenario absolutely yeah i, th- I think from but at the end of the day this is a space opera it's a film that has porgs in it yeah so, i suppose uh, i mean but that would then also say that you're like you're willing you've got to just kind of accept everything that you see on the screen at face value without tremendous amount of thought and i feel like star wars that's not the case it usually um you, you you're kind of your investment and you you're invested and you believe and that that particular plot point, you're just like, what, what? Just tell. I mean, I, I, there's no way that it makes it makes no sense not to. It it makes no sense in the sense that I don't think Leo would turn to Holdo and say, right, Poe is a good kid, but he's got to learn a lesson. Like, why would Holdo know about that? And if she was told, why? Yeah, as you say, in that situation, I don't think she would do anything about it. So yeah. Um, I also I think I agree with um, I can't remember whose analysis this was oh um, it was um, Brady Harans actually on Hello Internet um, saying that she was poorly mm. cast it should have been someone that was unrecognisable like some some new actress uh, the fact that it was Laura Dern was distracting um, mm. but you know that's a minor point um, Leia uh, Liam goes on uh, Superwoman Leia was poorly done granted but no one seems to remember the poignant scene just before when she's floating in space I'd argue that what came immediately after that completely ruined the scene where she's floating in space leave her there yeah like yeah seriously guys just yeah. it would i was fully prepared for that to be that floating in space was meant to be like the homage moment to be like we've lost her she's gone now yeah and it would be like a nice way that you know like she's floating amongst the stars it's kind of like you know it's a nice way to send her off literally. exactly i was amazed <laughs> um, that they brought her back and then and then she, fly, she flies back to the ship like something oh it just it looks so ridiculous 
So yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure I agree there. Yeah. Uh, and then next point, Canto Bite, um, which I believe is the planet, the casino, um, yeah, uh, Monaco planet. Um, I disagree that it had no impact on the plot because in hindsight, yes, it doesn't have an impact. But as an example, Indiana Jones had no impact on the plot of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and yet it's considered a massive hit. I take your point that Indiana Jones had no impact on the ro- pl- on the plot of Raiders, um, mm. but. Um, I, sorry, I'll finish this point. Um, the plot teaches one of the most valuable lessons that I don't think has been taught properly regarding, uh, previously regarding the fact that both sides of the Force, light and dark, impact negatively on the people of the galaxy. It also helps in the character bonding of Finn and Rose. I disagree that it helps in the bonding of Finn and Rose. I don't think any, there's any connection there whatsoever, um, if I'm being yeah, brutally felt, honest. felt laboured. I think that I think you make you make a really good point about the uh, the lesson saying that both light and dark impact ne- negatively. I think that's that's quite poignant actually. Yeah, um, and I, it's just not presented in a way that that's obvious. And in our review previously, when we ranted about it for a, a long time, um, I think they should have expanded on that. I think that basically Canto Bite was a missed opportunity. Um, I think also think it shouldn't have been a, a planet that looked like it was from the prequels, and they tried to ham in a kind of. Also, yeah, there is the slight contradiction in the film of, like, animal rights stuff. Like, you know, all these creatures deserve to be free and not be mistreated. But then you also, in the same film, have Chewbacca literally catching, feathering, and cooking and eating porgs. Like, mm. it it just seemed a little bit contradictory uh, in the, in that sense, yeah. that we can, like, laugh at this, this family of birds, or whatever they are, um, like, seeing one of their, their friends eaten. And then in the same film have uh, the importance of letting go of the sci-fi racehorses um, who were yeah. definitely jumping deliberately car to car to try and cause damage um, rather than acting like an actual animal would. Um, yeah, I-, I take part of that point, but I disagree with, with it. Um, Snoke, he goes on to say, all caps, it's the second film in the trilogy, which means there's going to be one more film. There was a forced connection at the end between Rey and Kylo after Snoke's death. Let's wait and see if JJ revisits Snoke before jumping to conclusions that he's truly dead. Now, Kim, I, I can't think of a character, and I'm going to caveat this, I can't think of a character that suffered a grievous, as grievous a wound way, in the Star Wars universe hey, as nice. Snoke and survived. Yeah. I think there's a reason why they made they they focus so much on his death it's the classic film rule of if they were going to allude that he wasn't dead they wouldn't have shown such a such an injury on screen right? well also don't don't you see a close-up of like his eyes like his lifeless eyes looking forwards i think i think you do. yeah um yeah i mean i, I mean I, there's nothing i mean you know f- f- you know force ghost or some who or kind of like a voice from from beyond the grave then potentially but i don't you know he's certainly not coming back is he I don't think so. I mean, so to return to no. the caveat before, I realised that Darth Maul technically survives in the extended universe. Um, like he, in the Clone Wars, he comes back and fights Obi Wan with like a set of robot legs. Um, yeah, but the 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 uh, the extended universe is a f-ing, it's like the outer rim. It's like it's just it's, da- <laughs> it's a dangerous, dangerous place. Yeah, it's it's like Camelot. So it's let's not go to the let's not go to the star wars extended universe it is a silly place so um yeah i i disagree with that i think that snoke was completely mishandled um i mean i i i respect your opinion i just i in the, yes there is another film maybe something yeah. will happen but i really don't think it will um but let's see as you say and then lastly captain phasma poorly handled i'll give you that one i don't think there's any defense of how captain phasma fit into this film mm. the only the yeah. only cool thing was the fact that her armor was shown to deflect blaster bolts that's yeah. literally it so yeah, yeah. Uh, basically he concludes that um that he loved the jet last jedi it doesn't get enough praise um and it's different from other star wars films um and he thinks that's what makes it that's what makes it great um i agree in that sense that it's different and that's really good and it's a step in the right direction i just think it's not been done right yeah i completely agree We've got an email here from Lucas Kopp uh, titled Maple Syrup and, Ad- and Adolescent Drinking, The Nation of Canada. Oh, uh, Canada! Him to say, Thank you very much for mentioning my email in the last episode. I thought you found, I hope you found it helpful. I don't blame, uh, I don't blame for not reading it. It was, um, it was very extensive, um, but realise something from the whole response business. I know a lot about the country I live in. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise. I bet you know a lot about your country, but unfortunately, nobody knows anything about Canada. In short, there comes a time within when every podcast graduates from a child to an adult, and the graduation is sometimes hallmarked by Canada. <laughs> it's time you acquired someone who is a reliable listener, an expert on Canada, and a really bad, though passionate, ice hockey player. 
<laughs> I believe it's my responsibility to step up and volunteer my services as the first Wikicast resident expert of Canadology. Feel well, free to consult me on any matters that pertain to Canada and any surrounding culture. Keep in mind, I do not claim to be the ultimate Can- Canada tri- Canadian trivia lord. In fact, I don't really know much about Canadian history, but I'm a big fan of beer and Ryan Gosling. <laughs> we can discuss my paycheck later, but for now, you have um, you uh, have yourselves a good day. Sincerely, Lucas, uh, clearly from Canada. <laughs> I mean, the, the position is open. I think we'd, we've always lacked. I, I didn't know what it was, but we'd lacked something. And I think that might just have been a resident expert of Canadology. Um, you're, you're a real um, skookum academic. Is that right? Did I use that mm. right? I think, I think specifically yeah. that is like quite a rural thing. So it might be that not every Canadian uh, like uses that. But I have on authority that that is a real Canadian phrase. But you can, yeah. if we were to ever go to Canada, it would be a delight for you to teach us to bite the biscuit uh, and um, ice hockey. I don't know anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know any other Canadian slang. Perhaps, Lucas, you could send us a primer on, like, if we were to go to Canada, like, Canada 101. What is the intro to Canada that, that you could give the podcast that, that we can read out next time? That's a challenge for you. If you mention Justin Bieber, I swear to God, I'll fucking kill you. We also have a very brief email um, from Sierra. Uh, who correctly points out a massive cock up I made last week? As a literature last student week? myself, whose specific whose uh, speciality in, is in the nineteenth century, this was bugging me the entirety of the last podcast. Jane Eyre is written by Charlotte Bronte, not Jane Austen. It's very true. Um, I think I was yeah I was on a I was on an Aust- Austinian ramble uh, and uh, and massively ballsed up there. Um, it's yeah it's Charlotte Bronte, not Jane Eyre. Very different styles and about thirty years in between the two of them. Um, How disappointing. True. True, how disappointing. <laughs> yes. I mean, very, very different style, very different styles in the context of, of about 30 years. As, as far as kind of like styles of writing, I would say that they're probably closer together than looking at that. And like, I don't know, we've mentioned, we mentioned Byron. I mean, yeah. Um, but yes, but yes, very uh, excellent points here. I, uh, I apologize for that, uh, for that slip of the tongue. Yeah. Next up, we have an email from Adam Wrigley titled Hymnus and Morris. Um, apparently, one of our episodes has been taken off the podcast feed. I will have a look into that. But what is most interesting, Adam, is your postscript, uh, which we get a clue from by your sign off saying, keep up the good work and tinkety tonk and down with the Nazis has actually become more relevant in recent times. He has sent us a link to wikipedia.net, which is a Wikipedia mm. about the jokes and themes in Komodo Mayo's film review show. Mm. Um, so um, I will send you this link, Dan. Um, this this is thank you for this very quickly, Adam. I just wanted to say thank you for sending us this. Um, yeah. in- I'm familiar with the kind of the world of Wittertainment and kind of the the app they have and stuff, but I haven't I've never actually been onto Wikipedia. There um, is also a random exciting. article button like we use to generate this podcast on Wikipedia. So I'll just click it. Angelina Jolie. Oh, wow. Oh, I've got Jason Isaacs. Hey. Did you get Jason Isaacs? Yeah, I did. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Hello to Jason Isaacs. All right, Jason. Thank you, Adam, for this. This is amazing. Uh, we have an email here from Emma Cavana. Cavana. Um, <laughs> dear Simon and Dan, I've been a reader of the Wikicast since the first episode and have recently become one of your top lads, which I hope hey. counts as five votes for Team Dog on no, Patreon. <laughs> I must offer you my congratulations on the correct pronunciation of my surname at the Kavana. end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it is of Irish origin and tends to give many people, including some of my closest friends, great difficulty. It is, however, a, an efficient way of sorting junk mail and cold calls. My, the worst attempt I've heard, someone made it rhyme with clunge. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I have been learning Italian as part of my first semester at the University of Nottingham, studying from an MA in musicology. Very cool. And I've suddenly realised that the language section of the podcast has been dormant for some time. I therefore have compiled a list of some of my favourite Italian words and some that we use in English but are commonly mispronounced for your amusement. Okay, here we go. Simon, you can kick off. Okay, uh, we'll have to put some appropriate music underneath this. So how are we going to do this? Are we going to? Am I going to say the Italian? Are we going to both? We both have a go at the Italian. I'll say it first, you say it second, and then I'll do the translation. How about that? Okay. 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 Giaccio. Giaccio. That, that's meant to be ice. I feel like we, we're not going to do very well at this. Apart from this next one, Bolognese. I think, I could be wrong, but I think it's Bolognese. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I mean. Yeah, I think it is actually pronounced like you have like Eze at the end. I could, I'm probably completely wrong, but I think that's right. All right. Well, that's the bowl part of Spag Bowl. And then. Oh, God. Sioglere? Sioglere? 
Yeah, I think I'm going the same with you. <laughs> going the same direction. That's meant to be the verb to melt. Followed yeah. by another verb. Oh, Lasciare? Lasciare? Okay, you, you've definitely like committed to that like mode of pronouncing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's yeah. to leave. Much like we wish we could leave this section of the podcast in the past because we're terrible at it. Um, let the past die. Kill it if you have to. Segno. Segno. That's meant to be sign. Ayoto. Gosh, that's really difficult. Oh, I don't know. Ayoto. Yeah, I'm going to say the same as you. Ayoto. That's meant to be help with an exclamation mark. So I think it's meant to be more like Ayoto. And it sounds more Japanese. But there you go. Oh, that's a, that's a point. To quickly interrupt this segment, cut the music. Um, I finally got to see the trailer for the Isle of Dogs, the new um, Wes Anderson film. Uh, yesterday when I went to see Darkest Hour really looking forward to it now I wasn't sold on it before but now I've seen the trailer I'm really really excited for that it looks great mm-hmm. uh, along with the trailer for oh there were some really really good ones okay sorry we'll go back to the podcast right bring the music back in um, oh what have you done I can't believe you've done this Emma um, the next two right Pesca Pesca that's meant to be peach and then Piesca Pesca <laughs> <laughs> That's meant to be fishing. <laughs> There's something no different. Idea. And then, oh, Emma, you are a cruel, cruel mistress. Um, Jesus. Oh, God. Here we go. There's going to be a long... In the actual recording, there's going to be a long pause here whilst I try and work out how to pronounce this. Chia Chia Riccio. Chia Chia Riccio? <laughs> <Bless you. laughs> That's meant to be chit-chat. Oh, my God. The bottom one's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. Cinque cento cinquanta cinque. Cinque cento cinquanta cinque. Yeah. You definitely sounded more like Spanish. <laughs> Adam here. Cinque cento cinquanta cinquenque. <laughs> I'm getting flashbacks to my uh, my two years of IB Spanish. Uh, that's a five hundred and fifty-five, um, of course. If you can tell by our nice. flawless Italian. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Emma. We haven't done a language one for a while, uh, possibly because we're terrible at them. Uh, but she concludes, keep it up with the podcast and the videos. I particularly enjoyed the change in vlog format for Simon's hand-in video, as it felt appropriate to have a more retrospective outlook. Thank you. A lot of people seem to actually prefer that style that I did for that video than my normal style. Um, mm. So I might have to do that more in the future, actually. It was a mistake. It was like an accident, but like penicillin seems to mm. have had some good outcomes. Um, so thank you for that, Emma. She signs off with Pip Pip. Emma Kavanagh, age 22, and 41 over 52. Nice, 41 50 tooths. So hang on, how many weeks does that mean she is? That means she's 22 times 52 plus, uh, how many, was it 41? Mm. So you're uh, 1,185 weeks. It's like, 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 at what age as a parent do you stop giving your child's age in weeks? Like someone, your mo- someone looks at, asks your mother, how old is she? Like, oh, Emma, oh, she's 1,185 weeks now. <laughs> yeah. Bless her. A bit unwieldy. It's reached that time to, uh, to say a special thank you to our, uh, our top lad patrons uh, for, for, today's, uh, for today's podcast. Thank you um, so, so much, off. guys. Actually, before, mm. before we do, let's show we have an update on uh, Cats vs. Dogs. Uh, because Ooh, at, yes. at the moment Team Dog is coming in with 12 patrons but Team Cat are sneaking ahead with 18 patrons I mean okay so we've actually come ahead because we were we were exactly half like it was it was 7 and 14 last time I mean looking through the um, the donations I have noticed that one person uh, it is Eric Bolliger has sneakily donated $5 whilst being on Team Dog to try and like I have to I have to work out it's not easy to work out from Patreon Patreon, what the total is per tier. Um, I'll have to add mm. that up next time, but definitely... That's because Team Dog, team dog people are just very giving. Well, I mean, Team Cat people, uh, true to form for cats, just don't give a shit. Yeah. No, of course they give a shit because they're being wonderful and donating to us on, on Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com forward slash the wikicast. Um, but mm. if you'd like to see the ruling superiority of cats cast down, I mean, why would you? But uh, if you'd like to see that happen, then of course you should be donating even just a dollar a month to Team Dog uh, to help us grow the podcast. And of course, if you'd like to guarantee that cats are going to be ascendant in the future, then make sure you put your dollar in for team cat instead and without further ado let's uh let's um say a special thank you to our top lads uh who've uh, have helped us produce uh the uh this this uh this episode of the wikicast and we're going to kick off with lachlan woods he's a lad john mannion he's a lad nicholas 
He's also a lad. Luke Thatcher. Also a lad. Simon Torseth. Let me think about that. Wait. Uh... Oh, wait, you know, he's a lad. He's a lad. Alex Greer. Lad. Jordi Eschendahl. Oh, I, I thought you said Eschenwaltz for a second then, and I yeah, hardly no, left. Got, got really <laughs> excited. <laughs> he, he is, however, still a massive lad. Uh, Jono. Lad. Miles Cornfield. Lad. Matt Maguire. Lad. Look who it is. It's Emma Kavanagh. Lad. Jay Wright. No, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm actually just gonna leave that as it is. Um, yeah. Lad. <laughs> just leave <Angela>. that hanging. <laughs> Angelo. <laughs> absolute lad. Kieran Kelly. Lad. Wonderful Stephen. Shock lad. Ooh ha ha. Tapio Kirkinen. Tapio. Massive lad. Davy Schram Vontabel. Excellent pronunciation. Massive lad. Simon Vase. Excellent name. Massive lad. Oh gosh. <laughs> I'm gonna try my I'm gonna try my best here. As Hagu Nakapan Nagasaravanan. Questionable so pronunciation, but massive lad. And the one the only Dan Hanvey. It's it's oh do we even need to say it? Of course he's a massive lad. Yeah. Massive Dan, lad. I hope massive you're getting better. Lad. Thank you very much to everyone who supports us on Patreon. Particular thank you to our top lad supporters, but thank you very much to every yes. single person that donates to the podcast and helps us put money towards Wikicast merch, which should be happening sometime soon. So, Simon, what have we learned today? Well, Dan, we actually learned, if you've cast your mind back, uh, about cork encoding, uh, which yes. is a character encoding used for encoding glyphs into fonts uh, in uh, LaTeX. So relevant to my thesis, this is what I did, and we, we yeah. picked out a few characters. And then from then, gosh, well, how do we move on from here? We, we, we went to emojis. Yes, we went to emojis. And if anyone could explain to me why it's called white smiling face, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Because, I don't know, that seems weird to me. Um, I think it's yeah. I'm going to go with it was it was it's pre-color. Yeah. Um, it was the standard white smiley. <clears throat> but uh, if I'm incorrect, let me know. But then after that, we moved on uh, to some errata uh, with my skookum chucher. Uh, we talked about mm-hmm. J.K. Rowling. We talked then uh, we in did. Uh, Critics Corner about Darkest Hour briefly and the Oscar nominations for way too long, probably. Very true. And then we had a very deep uh, discussion in. Uh, agony corner or crisis corner yeah. possibly if you wanted it to be alliterative uh about sort of passion versus what you're good at and then i think yes. a, a pretty pretty solid correspondence corner apologies to everyone who didn't get their email read out we just had so many this week and we had to mm. we had to push things along after after our unfortunate accident our gold schmilting accident yes. involving a microphone I'm, uh, I'm very sorry everyone my uh yeah cocktail <laughs> my, my my bad my bad but we returned to them, granted in, in haste. Yes. Uh, but uh, but we got there in the end. Make haste. Gondor calls for spades. Wait. Gondor calls for spades. They've got a lovely beach down at Dol Amroth. <laughs> Gondor calls for buckets and spades. And that's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook. And if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. Reminders for Dan to keep his microphone turned on. Canadian facts and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole. And we'll we'll see see you next time. And that's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to... Oh, that sounded really forced and really fast. <laughs> that's all for this week's episode. <laughs> it was the fact that there's a comma after episode, but I, I read it as, that's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your <laughs> podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook. And, and if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel. I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. I look yeah. like David Cameron if he was C- made of gold rather than ham. That's all for this week's episode, Master Luke. <laughs>